Hey guys, Sherry from The Watering Mouth here. I'm bringing a really fun interview with you today. Now, as y'all may know, I had a cancer journey last year, unfortunately, but it brought me to Chris Wark of Chris Beat Cancer. Uh, when I went on my cancer journey, everyone started flooding me. If you got to check out Chris, you got to check out Chris, you got to check out Chris. And so I did. I was not disappointed and I knew I had to bring him on to talk to you guys today. So without further ado, hello, Chris Wark of Chris Beat Cancer. Thank you for being here. Hi, it's good to be with you. And uh, it's great. It's great that so many people in your life were sharing, you know, my resources, my books, or my website or interviews I've done or whatever with you, because you do tend to get bombarded with information when you're diagnosed with cancer. And a lot of it, you know, I went through cancer when I was 26 years old, and this was 2004. And a lot of the information that you get is not helpful. <laughs> and that was one of the reasons, like once I got well, it was the impetus for me starting crispbeatcancer.com was just as a blog to share information that I really thought helped save my life. And that was centered around nutrition and natural non-toxic therapies. And uh, so, yeah, it's just great. I mean, I just, I've been doing this for 10 years. Well, no, almost 12 years. And it's just, even though, I've, you know, been able to reach a lot of people. I'm still so excited when I hear that someone heard about me from a friend or, a, you know, a family member. I mean, I think word of mouth is probably still the biggest way people find out about me. Well, that's, that's great. It's not good to find out about you from the circumstances, but it's good to know that those resources are out there. Um, so you said you've been doing this for 12 years. How long ago was it that you actually had cancer? So the diagnosis happened in 2003, basically December 2003. Mm -hmm. And I had surgery. They took out a third of my large intestine. It was stage three colon cancer. Okay. And uh, at 26 years old, you know, it's, a, it's pretty shocking to get a cancer diagnosis of any kind. But colon cancer, especially in young adults, is one of the fastest growing segments of cancer. Yeah. Right. In terms of like which cancers are really becoming a problem, young adult colon cancer. So I was sort of in that early first wave or whatever. Um, and uh, my generation is the fast food generation. Yep. I'm 45. I was born in 1977. And I had my first birthday at a McDonald's. <laughs> uh <-huh>. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, in the 80s, when I was a kid, in the 90s, right, fast food was just exploding right it was microwave food and fast food w w w the, the industry was just growing by leaps and bounds right i mean yeah. they were putting new fast food restaurants on every corner taco bell kfc mcdonald's burger king wendy's subway right i mean domino's yeah. pizza pizza Hut, i mean just on and on and on and so yeah there that again the gen x was really the first fast food generation and of course it's gotten worse for subsequent generations Absolutely. but yeah those um diet and lifestyle choices compound over time the unhealthy ones so anyway yeah i was having abdominal pain and went to the doctor and you know uh they couldn't figure it out and eventually i was referred to a gastroenterologist they did a colonoscopy they found a golf ball sized tumor they rushed me into surgery <clears throat> which is really typical for cancer patients they don't know What's happening to them? They don't have time to read and research and yes. and to take a step back and think about, okay, you know, is something, are there aspects of my life that may be contributing to my disease? And if so, what do I need to change in my life, right? These are important questions that you need to ask yourself for any disease, right? Any type of chronic disease, not because you got the flu, right? Or a head cold, but like, you know, if you have a chronic disease that's an inflammatory disease, autoimmune or cancer, <clears throat> there are diet and lifestyle factors that contribute and you, you got to learn what they are. And I say this all the time, but you know, you've got a problem, you have to become a problem solver. And a lot of us abdicate that to doctors and expect, expect doctors to solve our problems. And a lot of times they don't, you know, we've seen friends and family members who've had health problems and, and the, the solution quote solution is uh, just prescription medication medication, which doesn't solve the problem. Yep. Right. It just makes it a little easier to live with. 
And I think with cancer too, there's, there's this idea that cancer is in, in a class all its own, right. That like, okay, heart disease, maybe you have some time to work on it. You know, these other things, you have some time to work on it perhaps, but cancer. Oh no. Immediately. You must go to the doctor. They will figure it all out for you. They, you know, there's no personal responsibility. I've heard you talk about that before. And just that, um, and, and I have to say that on my journey, it happened so quick as well that I didn't even have time to research anything. And there was a point where I was in there going, all right, well, what type of cancer do I have? How slow is it? And mine was ended up being stage two um, breast cancer and it was not aggressive. So, you know, it wasn't sort of this lucky category where I felt that I actually had some time, but for anyone who has a diagnosis that's, you know, more serious or whatever, you still get pushed. I was even pushed to let's do something. Let's get this going. Even from loved ones. I know you talk about pressure from loved ones as well. Not that it's a bad thing. They love you, but it, there's just so much fear and terror around it. And I remember the decisions that I had to make about, do I get a mastectomy? Do I just chop off a part of my body? Right. Those decisions. I remember specifically taking some time to just lay in bed and think and to research stories of other women who had gone through similar things. And that gave me sort of this space to just think and go, what is right for me? Whereas so many people I know have made decisions um, based on fear. And I was reading in the forums, women that said that I, I saw some statistic that was, I want to say 70% of women regretted getting a mastectomy. And um, that for me was just, that was huge. And it was heartbreaking for me um, to think that I was so close to choosing that option, right? And going like, well, I could live with it. It would be fine. At least I know I wouldn't get cancer, but that's not, it's not a true statement necessarily. You know, there's so many other factors. So fear, I think, plays such a big role in this. Yeah, it's a huge role. And it's, it's so great that you did that, right? That you approached it that way, because that is exactly what I'm trying to encourage every cancer patient to do. Mm -hmm. It's not what I did because I was rushed in yeah. out of fear. And, uh, and that is the MO. It's used fear to rush patients into treatment and doctors who are well-meaning feel like they need to do something rather than nothing. Yep. It makes them feel better about their profession because if they do nothing, they're not actually practicing medicine. Right. right? There, that's which it is, by the way, but they feel like it isn't. Yeah. <clears throat> so, uh, you know, Hippocrates, the Hippocratic Oath, first do no harm. Yeah. And unfortunately, that's gotten tossed out the window when it terms in terms of cancer treatment mm -hmm. and other drugs, uh, because these drugs are very harmful. And uh, there's a number of drugs on the market. If you have ever watched television, <laughs> you've seen the drug commercials. <laughs> yeah. With and, the and at the end of every drug. Of <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I mean, at the end of every drug commercial, there's this long list of side effects. And many times, if you pay attention, they will say may increase the risk of certain types of cancer. Mm, yeah. Right? But we tune or, it out, right? We just tune all that out. Well, and they do a very good job of trying to distract you with images of people <laughs> riding a bicycle built for two, <laughs> right? Or like chasing some ducks around a pond, you know, <laughs> or, or having a picnic. Yeah, which right? is which like, is creating more fear for you too, if you, especially if you're in the cancer place, because you're like, I really want to have that. I need to have yeah. that, right? I don't want to lose time. Right. Yes. If I take this drug, I could, I could enjoy a day at the park. Yes. Yeah. Yes. <clears throat> so it's, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, uh, they know what they're doing, uh, yeah. and and drug companies are in in business to make money. Period. Right. Right. End of sentence. That that's why they exist. They yeah. are companies that exist to make money, and it doesn't really matter if you get well. It doesn't matter if your health improves. It doesn't matter if you live or die. It yeah. doesn't matter yeah. to drug companies. I, I'm telling you, um, and they've got a long history of horrible behavior and criminal behavior. And um, so anyway, look, I didn't know any of that, but uh, I had the surgery. I woke up. They said you're stage three C, which is we were hoping it was stage two because that means you have surgery and you go home. Yeah. Um, and you're done. They're just like, we'll just monitor you after that. But uh, stage three C meant I needed nine to 12 months of chemotherapy. That's what I was told mm. after surgery. So a couple things happened in the hospital that uh, got me thinking differently. And the first thing that happened was the first meal that I was served 
after they took out a third of my large intestine. Oh God, here we go. <laughs> which was a sloppy Joe. And uh, the sloppy Joe, everybody's favorite. <laughs> yeah, we love sloppy Joes. <laughs> Everyone's favorite. Try to try to find a sloppy Joe. You can't. They don't. Nobody. No restaurants don't serve them because nobody like even them. the name. Even the name. <laughs> it's just so. Yeah, gross. <laughs> yeah. It was. You know, the sloppy Joe is kind of funny. You know, it's like it was invented by I don't know the army or something. It's like <laughs> industrialized cafeteria food. Yeah. Uh, the best example of that, and as far as I knew, right, the only place you could get it a like sloppy joe like yeah my mom had made them a couple times as i was a kid but generally it's like this is like summer camp or school yeah. lunches definitely in the military and definitely in prison <laughs> yeah it's like a it's a slop food like yeah <laughs> you just slop it over yeah right you just slop this ground beef and tomato sauce over on a bun or whatever mm -hmm. and i'm just looking at i'm looking at it going like ugh like gross right like this is not appetizing this is not what i want to eat mm. and like why are they serving this to sick people this is yeah. the this is horrible and i wasn't like uh, i wasn't eating healthy at all but i mean at least i had standards <laughs> and uh so anyway so th so that that was kind of strange and then a few days later i was told you can go home today which was great news and uh my surgeon came in to check on me and we were just having a conversation about what was next and i just happened to say hey is there any food i need to avoid because in my mind i was like thinking oh well they cut out a third of my large intestine right everything you eat is going down the tube yeah right it's going through there yep. and i don't want to eat the wrong thing and like melt the stitches right like is hot sauce <laughs> a problem yeah <laughs> you know so i'm like anyway yeah hey is there anything food i need to avoid or and he's like nah just don't lift anything heavier than a beer not only like have some beer buddy but don't avoid any certain foods that oh was permission my. right that was wow. permission to eat whatever i wanted mm -hmm. and yeah alcohol fine no problem yeah have some right? alcohol while you're at it <clears throat> so uh so i went home and i just decided okay i know what to do sloppy joes and beer i'm ready to become a cancer survivor uh so, no so i i you know i'm recovering on the couch and you know because i you they cut through my abdominal muscles you know it's probably not not unlike a c-section you know it's like yeah, you have I... to recover from that and anyway i'm uh sleeping on the couch and i'm trying to wean myself off pain medication over a few you know a few days to a week and as i sobered up i just started to think about the my grim prospects and my reality which was you know what is chemotherapy going to do to my body mm. and i didn't know anyone you know i had never personally watched a friend or family member go through cancer treatment yeah <clears throat> but i had seen advanced cancer patients out there in the world at a restaurant right or at the mall or at church and you know, when you see someone that has gone through round after round of chemotherapy and, you know, it's shocking, you know, what these treatments are doing to the human body. Yes. And, it, you know, and, and I'm not to not to disparage anyone going through chemo, but, you know, <clears throat> I, you know, it made an impression on me and I thought, is that going to be me? Right. And, and it was, that was pretty scary, right? That was a scary prospect of, and I, and I felt at my core that I wasn't strong enough to do it. And um, that's interesting. I didn't want to like no cancer patient wants to. Yeah, for sure. And um, they have to be coerced into it through fear. Can you, can you go back to the wasn't strong enough? Can you tell me a little bit about that? You know, that was basically just instincts and intuition. Mm. I was in a very weak state physically. Okay. I'd lost a ton of weight. Uh, in the year leading up to my diagnosis, I lost more weight in the hospital and I just felt weak, you know, and sick. And so, yeah, I just didn't, I just didn't feel strong enough. Yeah. And so that was a factor. And then, um, and, uh, and I knew chemotherapy was obviously really toxic, you know, and it made your hair fall out and it made people look really, really, really sick. Um, 
And I didn't know what else to do, but I didn't want to do that. And as I said before, pa patients are rushed into it out of fear and coercion. Yeah. And they're told, you're a fighter, you're a yeah. warrior. And the reason they tell them these things is because if you tell someone they're a fighter and a warrior and it's a battle, right? And then they adopt this mindset that also means you have to suffer. Oh, right, right. Right? Yep. If you're a fighter and you're a warrior and you're going to battle with cancer, mm. right? Then you should expect to, to have to suffer. Yeah. So this, this terminology is, from a marketing perspective, is brilliant, right? Um, but that's, that was adopted many years ago, and it, the cancer industry came up with this, this terminology, mm -hmm. right? The cancer fight, the cancer battle. Like, no, you don't fight cancer. It's not the point. These are your cells. It's your body. It's your DNA. You're not fighting yourself. It doesn't make any sense, yeah. right? If you have cancer, you're sick, and you need to heal. Mm -hmm. That's what you need to do. You need to heal. You don't need to yeah, fight we don't, it. We don't talk about diabetes in that way. We don't, right. you know, maybe some people say the fight against diabetes, but they, they don't really. It's usually just, you have diabetes, like let's get rid of it, you know, or you have heart disease, right. let's get better. We don't talk about, yeah, we don't really have that sort of battle mentality with right. other- The war on cancer mentality. Mm. Yes, yes. Yeah. Wow. And, uh, you know, historically, anytime the government declares war on something, there's a huge uh, multi-billion dollar money-making opportunity for mm. some large corporations. Yes. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, so the war on cancer failed, but billions of dollars have been made. And um, patients are not any, any really any better off. The, the, probably right. the most damning, damning statistic is that most people don't know is that um, chemotherapy has only reduced the death rate from cancer five percent in 60 years wow think about that in 60 years since chemo was rolled out the death rate overall in the u.s has come down five percent from cancer and yet the emotional toll alone that it takes on someone when they know that they're supposed to go through chemo I mean, what is the damage from that alone, right? Just the idea of I need to go through chemo, the fear, the stress, what's it going to be like? What yeah. am I going to end up afterwards? What am I going to lose by doing this? That emotional toll for 5% increase yeah, in chances? And, you know, I mean, and to be fair, it depends on the type of cancer, right? Sure, of course. So testicular, childhood leukemia, lymphomas, they have a much better progress report. Yeah. Right. So 90% of those patients, they live 10 years or more. And there's a there's a cure rate. There's a decent cure rate in those types of cancers. But the solid tumor cancers, breast, colon, liver, lung, brain, ovarian, cervical, uh, bone cancer, sarcomas, these cancers, they have made almost no progress. I mean, it's it's really, really shocking when you actually dig into the cancer industry research and all this stuff that I do in my first book. You just see that wow they they haven't they've made tons of money and have made very little progress and most cancer patients still die yes and they don't even measure it, the death rate uh, in terms of that's not their uh, they don't use that as a measuring stick they use uh, survival for example five year survival or mm. disease free survival right right we think survival means life and you just live and you're cured but it doesn't yes. mean that <laughs> oh wow okay I didn't even think about that mm -hmm. no. It, it just means we're from a point from two points in time. Are you still alive? That's all. So you can be a five year survivor, die two months later. You're still counted as a success, right? You're a successful five year survivor from this particular treatment. Wow. Forever. You're, you're always counted as a, as a successful treated five year survivor, right? Wow. Even though you're dead. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of statistical sleight of hand in the cancer industry and the drug industry. And, you know, you have to be wise and you have to kind of dig in and, and learn how the, how they manipulate the data and how they communicate the message to patients. Like when they say things like, oh, this drug is very effective. You think, oh, effective, that means cure. No, it doesn't mean cure. Effective means it's been proven to shrink tumors to some degree. Oh. That's all it means. Effective. <laughs> effective means that tumors shrink. Doesn't mean they go away. Just means 
there's some shrinkage temporarily that's effective right now we can call this drug effective mm -hmm. but the patient doesn't you know they hear effective and they think cure yes like well that my doctor says this drug is very effective right you're like well hang on what does effective mean did you ask that question and the answer is always no i have a guide that's a free download on my website it's called 20 questions for your oncologist it's on every page of chrisbeatcancer.com. So it's very easy to find. And it's a one hour audio program with a downloadable uh, list of questions and transcript that every patient needs to go through. And, and if you're a caregiver too, because there are questions you need to ask your doctor that could save your life. They will, these questions will save your life if you ask them, because if you don't, you're gonna get rushed through. Yes. You're gonna get very little information. It's mainly fear. And you can't make a good decision without all the information. And you can't make a good decision when you're in a state of fear. Agreed. You're going to make an irrational decision that's, yes. that's hasty and not well thought through. And so uh, the couple questions that I happened to ask when I went to this oncology appointment, my first on oncology appointment, was I asked if uh, there were any alternative treatments available, alternative therapies available. And just that question uh, set my oncologist off. I mean, it set him up. His demeanor changed. He started talking down to me. He started using, you know, intimidation. Like re he really ratcheted up mm. the intimidation and he sort of used everything in his arsenal to try to convince me to do chemo. I mean, you know, you know what's interesting, Chris? It is literally um, life or death, the tone of voice of your oncologist. That is a life or death. Oh thing, yeah. Right. And yeah, I noticed yeah. the same thing um, in, in many different conversations. You know, I had the the biggest smirk on my face when I looked at the oncologists that were available. And I was like, are you kidding me? They weigh 200 pounds. Mm. They don't know anything about nutrition. Like how That's could, how can I test, how can I trust a doctor who doesn't know anything about their own personal nutrition to have any, so when you say, when you say alternative therapies, immediately they think, oh, you want to go stand on your head in some, you know, shrine and, and, yeah. and, you know, whatever, eat rose petals or something. I don't know. Like they, they think right. you're just going to be doing some crazy thing. And you're like, no, I just want to know if there's any actual alternatives, right? Is there anything else we can do? And for them, right. to, like, I, I asked my doctor about it as well, like nutrition. And it was just like blank face, like nothing, like Right. That to me was okay. Uh, I feel lucky that I don't have a cancer that's super advanced, but this is scary for all the people who do that get no information about, could you at least slow down what's happening to you? Could you at least create some kind of a benefit, even emotionally, even if it's just feeling better while you're going through the whole thing, you know, you got to go through this stuff, at least having some good food, some good supplements or whatever to at least make that feel better. There's just no information available. Yeah. And doctors aren't trained in nutrition and yeah, for all, as far as alternative therapies go, yeah, I'm just like thinking, are there other treatments besides chemo? Mm -hmm. Right. That's really what I wanted to know. Yeah. And, and yeah, he, he, he didn't like that question at all. And, and, and again, the, the tone of the, of the appointment changed so dramatically after that, he even said during his, you know, rant, he was like, if you don't do chemotherapy, you're insane. And, and then a little later after saying some other stuff that kind of, I'll never, I, I've forgotten. Cause I was like deer in the headlights at yeah. that moment, but he happened to say, look, I'm not saying this cause I need your business, which was a, like a sales technique, right? That's the push away yeah. where you. You as a salesperson pretend to be indifferent, yeah. right? Like, like I, you know, it doesn't matter to me either way whether or not you do this, but it does because every cancer patient's worth three hundred thousand plus in mm -hmm. revenue mm -hmm. to the cancer industry from chemo, surgery, radiation, from you know, breast reconstruction, from nipple tattoos, yeah. wigs. I mean, you know, it's like this is a massive industry uh, to can extract. I, can I mention something too? Like th when you were talking about the nipple tattoos and stuff, it reminded me of a very tough moment in my journey where I was considering mastectomy. And there was a point because there was a point where I was ushered off to a plastic surgeon just to sort of talk about it. Like, would you, the doctor, the oncologist asked me, are you interested in mastectomy? And I'm like, 
on what grounds, like, this is my first appointment with you. I'm like, on what grounds? I don't even know. Like, what are we dealing with? Like, when would some, I I had a million questions come up from that question. And I was like, I don't know, I guess. I mean, I would consider it if it was necessary. And she's like, okay, well, let's make an appointment for you to start talking with a plastic surgeon because we have to get our schedules lined up and all that. And I was like, okay. So I go to this and I said to her, I'm like, I don't want any hard sales. Like I'm just getting information. And she's like, well, I'm sending to you a guy who's not like that at all. So I go and Chris, the whole meeting was him giving me all this like scary stuff. Like here's what could happen and here's what we would remove and here's what you would be left with. And then he showed me a bunch of pictures on his computer of botched mastectomies where he was like, here's what I usually fix. And so he's showing me all this botched stuff. And I'm like, he's pushing me towards implants. And I'm like, I am not the kind of person who was interested. I was like, I would like to avoid that if possible. And then he goes and shows me botched implants or botched mastectomies that he needed to fix with implants. And I'm like, wow, this is like the most salesy meeting I've ever been in for chopping off a piece of my body to give me information about something. As I walked out and I was walking out with him, he said, so which direction are you leaning? And I'm like, what do you mean? I mean, I literally just found out I had cancer like two weeks ago. And you're asking me based on no, like, we don't even have test results yet on anything that's a further test. And you're asking me if I want a mastectomy already. And you're asking me if I want implants already. Like the conversation was like zero to 60. And I'm like, and, and the part that got me the most, Chris was like, I was already convicted before I went that I didn't want implants. Like if I wasn't going to do so, I wasn't going to get implants no matter what, but if I was going to get a mastectomy, I wanted to see like how it worked and what they were going to do and all that. But the part that was the most devastating to me was when I left that that office and I thought to myself of all the women who also went to his office with more dire circumstances that wouldn't have the the sensibility or the the courage to be able to ask those questions and and be strong enough to, to take some time and think about it. And I cried for days about all of the women who are going through that right now, just chopping off parts of their body without even being told that they have an option, without even being told that the percentages of recurrence are minuscule comparatively for some cancers and some stages and things like this. And that the emotional toll it takes, and and the reason that your comment tripped me is because I started considering mastectomy before I considered the idea that that meant, this is maybe a little TMI, but like that would mean that I wouldn't have a nipple anymore. Like I would lose an entire erogenous zone in my body. And I hadn't even thought of it like that mastectomy meant that. And I was like, oh my God, I'm going to be missing a whole part of my body that feels really important to me. And I have, nobody says anything like that to you, right? Like nobody tells you that you're actually not going to have a nipple and they will have to tattoo it and there will be no feeling. And right. Like they don't, there's no informed consent whatsoever. I'm getting worked out because it's just, it makes me so angry to think of what all of the women and not just breast cancer, like any kind of cancer talking about what options we have and what's available to us. It is, it is a, it's a crisis. It's a tragedy. What's happening right now to so many people all over the country and in the world. It is a crisis. Thank you for sharing that. And I know um, you're absolutely right. Every cancer patient, their story is the same. Yeah. They're rushed into treatment out of fear. It's basically a bunch of sales pitches. Yes. And uh, and most of the time patients just say yes, cause they think they just have to say yes to the doctor cause it's their only option. And they're they're gonna just die like, okay, they I yeah. guess the doctor says, I got to do this. I got to get my breast cut off. I got to have yeah. chemo tomorrow. I got to start radiation next week. This is what I have to do now. Yeah. And, and there's no second guessing. There's no, some people are wired to kind of dig in and push back. Right. And say, what is it? Whoa. Huh? Oh, so pump the brakes here. Right. Yeah. Right. Hang on. Like, which obviously you did. And, and I did, I did a little bit, surgery. but I, I could have done it so much more too. Like, that's the thing. I think there's such a small percentage of folks who have even a little bit of that sort of a personality trait. I could have used so much more even, but I was afraid. And yeah, you know, yeah. yeah. Well, you know, this is a person of authority and, and yes. you assume that they are the expert and, and you they assume they care expertise. about you. Yeah. Yeah. They do have expertise, but you just have to 
you know, there's good doctors and bad doctors, right? There's, you know, there's some doctors that barely, barely got out of med school, right? They barely passed. <laughs> okay. So you got those, that group of doctors, True. and then you've just got doctors that maybe they're super smart and they made straight A's, but they're not good people. Yes. Right. I mean, yeah. they're just bad people. And, and yeah. this is not me picking on doctors. I'm just saying we have to be realistic in every profession. It's just human. There are good yeah. people and bad people and the bad people, they don't care about others. They only care about themselves and they care about money. Right. And, um, they will, you know, exploit you and coerce you and, you know, basically try to make as much money off you as possible. Yes. And it's funny, you know, <laughs> just kind of made me laugh internally as you said this, but, you know, when he said, which way are you leaning? It, I would have, it would have been amazing for you to say, I don't know, which way is the door? I'm leaning that <laughs> way. Right. <laughs> that would have been the perfect response. I'm leaning yeah. toward the door. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so anyway, yeah. Um, let you know, me, that's a, let's pause real quick. Mm -hmm. I, I, we'll come back to this. This is so valuable, I think, for so many people watching. And for me to be able to talk to you personally about my own stuff, huh, it's, it's bringing up some good stuff and making me feel, you know, justified in so many things that I went through. Um, and hopefully this will help someone else to pause as well. But I want to take an actual pause and just get to your books really quick, because I want to take a moment to talk about what's going on with you. I mean, you can see right behind you, you've got Crispy Cancer, which is your first book. Is that right? Yeah, that was you have, this one. Yep, the Wait, blue there one. There it is. There it is. Got, there it is. <laughs> I always tell people I can never be a weather a weather yeah. woman because I always <laughs> right, think right, right, totally. Um, and then you've got Beat Cancer Daily, which is the red one. Just tell me yep. really briefly what are the other, difference between those arm. two? Yeah, so obviously I can talk for hours and hours and hours about the cancer right. industry and about my story and about what yeah. I did and all that. But I I started writing a book years ago and it took me a long time to write it because i was still trying to learn and understand the cancer industry and under, understand nutrition and the natural approaches to health and healing which is what i ended up doing that's why i got well yeah. it's because i said no to chemotherapy and i overdosed on nutrition i adopted a raw food diet i started juicing i found a naturopath i found an integrative oncologist and i just decided that i was going to do everything in my power to support my body's ability to heal I was going to change my whole life and I just I took the reins and decided I'm going to live or die on my own terms. Mm. And I wanted to live. I got very clear that I I want to live and I and I got very clear about why I wanted to live, who I wanted to live for, my wife yes. and my parents. That was yes. those are the main, you know, people in my life that I was like I cannot let these people bury me. Right. I can't do it. I yeah. have to live for these people. I'm a really big deal to these three people. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> okay. So, for sure. but anyway, so uh, that's just the, the preface here. But anyway, I wrote, yeah, I published a book in 2018 called Chris Beat Cancer, and that tells my whole story and exactly what I did to get well. And then also, you know, there's several chapters in there that, it, that really go deep on the, the medical, pharmaceutical, and cancer industries. And, and they're not all bad. But yeah. there's some critical information you need to understand about how these industries operate, right? So that you don't get sucked in uh, out of fear to into treatments that yes. uh, you don't understand or that could be potentially harmful or not helpful. Yes. And um, so that's the, that was the purpose of that book. It's sort of threefold. Tell my story, educate people on the industry so they can navigate it, right? Navigate the, the perils and pitfalls, avoid those. And, um, and then give them, empower them with prescriptive information on diet and lifestyle. Cause there's so much incredible nutritional science on how diet and lifestyle improve survival. They not only reduce your risk of getting cancer, reduce your risk of a recurrence, increase your odds of survival. Like your daily choices can yes. make all the difference between survival and death. Even if you're doing everything your doctor says, mm. healing happens at home. So it's ah. what you're doing at home between treatments that is going to make all the difference. And so that is an empowering message. And, yes. and I'm, I'm fighting against, as a survivor and as a patient advocate, I'm fighting against this sort of horrible notion that, that cancer patients are given by so many oncologists, which is that there's nothing you did to contribute to your disease. Yes, right, right. And and there's nothing you can do to help yourself except mm -hmm. for show up for treatment. 
Yes, right? it's powerless. Yep. You're a powerless victim. Yes. Of disease, right? And yeah. when you're a powerless victim, you know what comes along with that? Well, depression, discouragement, yes. right? Hopelessness, inaction. You just, you just you just go home and there's nothing I can do. Right. But even There's, worse than eating worse, not exercising, right? Sure. Your ha any habits that you had before when you're in a state like that tend to go down the drain. Totally. What's the point? Right. Yeah. What's the point? My doctor said yeah. my diet doesn't matter. You know how many times I've heard that? <laughs> yeah, my doctor I, said I, it doesn't matter what you eat. I exactly. And I recall putting up a post on my Facebook page when I actually announced it to my own friends, my personal page. And I, I, and I'll never forget this. It, I don't forget all the good comments, but I forget. I, I won't forget the one comment from a girl from my high school who said, "Oh, nobody knows what cancer, what make, what creates cancer, anyways. So have the burger, right? right? Right. And that is the pervasive idea in our country about what happens when you get cancer. Oh, yeah. now it's time to just live it up. That's right. And that's just, you know, that's spoken out of ignorance because we do know what's causing exactly. cancer. I go into great detail in the, in the, in so many of the known causes of cancer in my books, my first two books. And uh, because when you learn what's causing it, you can remove those things from your life. That's important, right? If, if you've got a problem, like I said earlier, you need to become a problem solver. Yes. And if you look up and there's water dripping from your ceiling, well, you can, you can approach that in a few different ways. You can put a bucket under it and catch the water, and that will prevent the water from uh, messing up your carpet or maybe your hardwood floors. Okay, that's, that's a good first step. Yeah. But if that's all you do, eventually that bucket's going to fill up with water, right? It's going to overflow. It's going to cause more problems. You got to get up in the attic. You got to figure out, is this a plumbing leak? Yeah. Is this a roof leak? And then you got to patch the leak, right? You have to solve the problem. You got to get to the root cause and fix it. Mm -hmm. So that's, that is really the philosophy of holistic health is solving the root cause of disease. And there's no miracle cure or magic bullet. That is uh, magic bullet medicine is, is a, a term that I coined because that's what pharmaceutical medicine is, right? That's what they're selling you. One pill for every ill, yes. right? This bullet, this, this magic bullet will cure your ailment, right? almost never works unless we're talking about, you know, an antibiotic. If you have a life-threatening bacterial infection, great, terrific. That'll, that can save your life. But generally speaking, pharmaceuticals don't cure people. And um, we've been conditioned, right, to believe in them, in this magic bullet medicine. Yes. And people take that same philosophy and that same mindset into the natural world. And they're like, isn't there a supplement I can take to cure myself? No, right? There's no one supplement that's going to cure you. But radical life change radically changing your diet, changing everything about your life uh, will help your body heal, right? It will unlock healing potential. And so this is the message, right? It's not an easy one because you didn't get cancer overnight. You can't heal it overnight. Healing takes time. Chris, why do you think that people believe, I mean, where is the disconnect, right? Where people might hear that from somebody like you, but perhaps they still have resistance to it. Why is there a disconnect there and going, my body is capable of healing cancer? Well, I think there's a lot of contributing factors, but number one is change is hard, right? People don't like to change. We get comfortable in our routines with our, we get comfortable with our favorite foods and with our favorite bad habits and our favorite bad mindsets, right? And our, our beliefs, we get, you know, we do, we, we become programmed over time to think and act and react in a certain way, right? And we come, become pretty predictable as people, right? Your personality becomes programmed over time. And so it is hard to break that. It takes deliberate, consistent effort to break that. And for some people, it just feels like too much work. They don't want to give up their bad habits. Mm -hmm. They don't want to give up their favorite foods. And cancer, a cancer diagnosis is depressing, right? It's it can cause PTSD. It's such a traumatic life event that people will seek to medicate, right? They need they want to medicate this fear and yes. anxiety and pain. And so, well, they're going to do that with their favorite foods, right? With cigarettes, with alcohol, with prescription drugs. Like they're going to gravitate towards those things that are actually harmful in the long term. But and so that that really I think 
at the core of it, that's why it is hard for people to change. Um, and it's, you know, uh, most cancer patients are not willing to do what you did or what I did. Yeah. They're not willing. Uh, they're not willing to accept responsibility that they may have contributed yes. to their disease. It but then also there is that, there is that, um, as, as you've been touching on so perfectly, there is also the side of it that has nothing to do with the person. It's the messages that they're receiving, right? Yes. So they are also just programmed belief wise that there is nothing that they can do. I mean, their doctor will literally tell them, yeah, you don't, there's no nutritional advice for me to give you, right? You just have to take right. the chemo, Right. Right. And so that that only builds on this problem when the doctor says it's not it's nothing you did. No, you don't need to change your diet. No, you don't need to get on the internet. No, you don't need to take any supplements. Right? No, there's no alternative therapies. Right? Those don't work. Then the, the, the person, you know, this is very useful, because then the person just says, Okay, I'll just do what you say. And I'll just come to, you know, do all the treatments you say to do, yeah. and cross my fingers and hope for the best. Mm -hmm. And my message is, hey, no, there are things you can do. There's a lot you can do and then you should do and these things will help you and they will not harm you, right? These are do no harm therapies, right? Yes. Nutrition is a do no harm therapy and there's so many other uh, diet and lifestyle practices and, and alternative therapies that will not harm you. There's no risk of harm. There's only risk of benefit, not risk, but there's only potential for benefit. Mm -hmm. And so that is my part of my message that I'm constantly trying to get out there to people to encourage them to give them hope and empowerment, right and inspiration and motivation. Yes. And so my second book is really, it's called beat cancer daily. And that is a daily devotional or daily reader. It's 365 pages. And you know, I just know like the cancer journey is, it's a one day at a time journey, right? Mm -hmm. This is life. And so every day, we need to be reminded about what's truly important. And we need just a little bit of help, a little bit of encouragement, uh, a little bit mind, a little bit of a mindset shift to stay on track, right? Like you got to stay on the healthy path. And healing, like, like I said, it doesn't happen overnight, it takes time. And so what is the most important is consistency right? You have to create a healing plan, a healing routine for yourself that's sustainable, that's reproducible every day. That has to do with what you're putting in your mouth and the way you're treating your body and the way you're thinking and the way you're acting, right? And your stress, which we can talk about. And then you have to reproduce that every day. And every day is a little different and that's fine. And there's no perfect days. Uh, although some days feel pretty perfect, but the goal is not perfection. The goal is progress. And so anyway, the Beat Cancer Daily uh, was published in 20, uh, 2020. Um, and um, just my way of it, providing more encouragement, practical advice, action steps, inspiration every day to people in our community that uh, that want that, right? And because again, it's just, just a daily journey, just got to be reminded, it's easy to get distracted, right? Yeah. And knocked off course. And, and one of the entries in there is is... Oh, well, I was just going to say one of the entries in there is kind of early in the book is called Point Your Ship Toward Healthy Island. And this is really, this is really encapsulates the entire journey because you have a goal, right? you have a destination, it's Healthy Island, right? That's where you want to be, right? That's where you want to go. And you're on a ship and you're on the ocean and you got to point your ship toward Healthy Island. And guess what? The wind and the waves can either be at your back and, and helping you, or they can knock you off course and beat you up, but it doesn't matter, right? You can always right the ship and point it back toward Healthy Island. So every day it's like, just make sure you're pointing your ship toward Healthy Island with your daily choices. So anyway, so that's the point of that book. And um, and it's it's been, a, it's just been, it was a really fun book to write. And I uh, got to share a lot of, you know, my heart and, um, in there and the feedback from the book's been just off the charts great so yeah, i think it's it's kind of like um that buddy that we all wished we had we could call every day and just you know get some advice get get something to sort of point you towards healthy island every day right like let me just get on the right track for the morning and you have someone who has been through it who also understands the nutritional side of it and all of that uh it's that's a fantastic fantastic way to write that book yes yeah thank you so I, I want to talk before we, you know, run out of time. I want to, 
and we haven't even really gotten into the nuts and bolts <laughs> of what I did because there's just lots to talk about. But, but you know, fruits and vegetables are incredible. They're so good for you. And the more you eat, the better. Uh, I ate, I went from eating one to two servings a day on a normal day. If you count, you know, lettuce and tomato on a hamburger, uh, to eating between 15 and 20 servings of fruits and vegetables every day. Wow. That's amazing. And that's what I call massive action. Mm -hmm. I took yeah. massive action and guess what? Massive action produces massive results. That's right. Right. If you, if you're trying to do something big, if you're trying to get, you know, a big important result in your life, you better take some big action. Yeah. So that was the first step for me was what I call overdosing on fruits and vegetables. And that included juicing and eating giant salads on the cover of my cookbook, the giant, which we call it the giant cancer fighting salad. Yeah, there it is. Where, there it is. Yeah. <laughs> um, and yeah, I have, uh, we do that every day on, on my site too. I got my salad right out there. I finished it this morning already. Nice. <laughs> That's awesome. So, yeah. you know, I realized the best thing I could do for myself was to eat th this incredibly broad spectrum of fruits and vegetables every day. Just the, mm -hmm. the most, the broadest nutrient profile possible, right? And that that's the giant salad, broccoli, cauliflower, kale, cabbage, onions, mushrooms, sprouted legumes, um, uh, sauerkraut, apple cider vinegar, olive oil, mm -hmm. some, some delicious herbs and spices. I mean, it just, it just, you know, I just kind of figured out this is simple. I can do it every day. I can do it twice a day for lunch and dinner. I could technically have done it three times a day, but I just couldn't get motivated to eat it for breakfast. <laughs> but, but that's what I did every single day, lunch and dinner, every day, every day, every day. Cause I just realized, you know, this actually simplifies my life. Yes. I know it gave me the confidence that I was putting as much nutrition as possible into my body that could help it repair, regenerate, detoxify and heal. Yes. And it simplified my grocery store shopping. It removed decisions that, uh, you know, I didn't have to make any more like, what am I going to eat for lunch? I already know. What am I going to eat for dinner? I already know. Right? What do you say to the people who have um, thoughts in their head that go, number one, <clears throat> you're eating too many vegetables or you're, you're going to get too much of something, or there's the opposite of people who say, because, because I, and I asked that question because I know you used to juice a ton of carrots every day and you used to juice lots of things. So first of all, the question of what if you get too much of something uh, like um, something that's like, say, goitrogenic, right? Like it creates goiters or thyroid issues or something like that. And then what do you say to the people who say, well, where's your variety there? <laughs> so first of all, if you have a strong will to live, if you have what I call the beat cancer mindset, uh, which is the same common mindset that everybody I know who has healed and survived against the odds. If you have that mindset, if you're determined to live, then it's easy to eat the same thing every day. It's easy. It wasn't hard. I want to live. I want to overdose on nutrition. I want to supply my body with the broadest array of vital anti-cancer nutrients possible. And that's what you find in the giant salad. Mm -hmm. So that part was easy. I would eat tree bark if there was evidence, <laughs> right? I would drink Honest. my own urine. <laughs> I would do that if there was like, you know, Heck, I wouldn't even need a, a clinical trial if I just met a guy who cured his cancer doing that. I would be inclined to do it. Okay, <laughs> give it a try. <laughs> right. So, so, so the, changing my diet was the easiest part. It really was. And it's. And by the way, the giant cancer fighting salad is so delicious. I just craved it. Yes, those I are wanted. Good. You know, I, 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 I kind of got. Scared. Yeah. I got I got the kind of concoction figured out and the and the spices and the and the dressing and all that. And I was like, this is really good, man. This is great. I love this. And so it became easy to eat because I enjoyed it. It tasted good, and then I started craving it. So that part was easy. Uh, as, in terms of like, oh, what what about uh, what if it's too many carrots? What about too much broccoli? This is what we say. Don't worry about that stuff. Okay, it's a rare person that might have some issue with something too much of something in a vegetable, maybe, but don't don't worry about it. Okay, I mean, and if you think about it rationally, it's it's sort of this lopsided uh, logic where it's like, oh, but you're not worried about chemo, right? <laughs> Hoping you, you were you, gonna say that. <laughs> you're worried about there's too much sugar in carrots. You know, but the chemo is fine. I asked the question, hoping you would say something just like that. <laughs> yeah, 
I mean, <laughs> but you know, seriously, but these are the kind of conversations doctors literally say, oh, don't drink too much. Don't drink carriage juice. That's too yeah. much sugar. Oh, that's extreme. What? They, that's just too extreme to, right. to have too, carriage Don't, juice. don't yeah. eat raw foods. Don't eat raw fruits and vegetables. That's an extreme <laughs> diet. But we're literally, we're going to inject you with a drug that can cause cancer. Most chemo drugs are carcinogenic. Mm. They can cause cancer. And here's the paradox. The paradox of chemo is, yes, these drugs can shrink tumors. They can kill cancer cells. But generally, what happens is uh, they don't kill the cancer stem cells. And in the process of shrinking tumors or whatever, uh, the cancer stem cells become more aggressive. Mm. And when, and by the way, the chemotherapy drugs are causing brain damage, liver damage, lung damage, heart damage, cardiovascular damage, immune system damage, digestive system damage, nerves, nervous system, nerve damage. They're, they're causing this collateral damage, you know, head to toe that your body now has to use even more energy and resources to repair. Yeah. So when chemo is over, your immune system's wiped out, your mm -hmm. body is wrecked, yeah. right? And you have more aggressive cancer cells, cancer stem cells that can multiply unchecked. Because what cancer patients are not told is that, hey, you know, you, you may have a tumor, you may have cancer, but your immune system is fighting, right? Your immune system is working. It's trying to keep you alive. It's not working at optimal levels. If it yeah. was, you wouldn't have tumors. But it is still in, it's, it's still there. It's still operating. You still have natural killer cells and B cells and T cells and, you know, lymphocytes. And anyway, so like nutrition gives your immune system ammunition, right? Nutrition is ammunition for your immune system. Okay. Without nutrition, you got no ammunition. Like you're fighting with no weapons. Without your immune system, you're fighting with no army, mm. right? You've got no soldiers. How are you going to win if you think it's a battle? How are you going to win this battle with no army? So that's the paradox of chemo. It's a short-term solution for a long-term problem. And doctors are so fixated on getting this short-term result so they can high-five about yes. it, right? Yeah. Like, yeah, we shrunk your tumor 30%. Yeah, <laughs> right? But like, oh, but your immune system's gone now. Mm. it's wrecked and you know and they know they're not going to tell you this because they don't want to scare you but they know oh yeah in three months six months that cancer is going to be all over mm. right it's going to be back back there's it's going to show up in her bones in her liver maybe in her lungs maybe in her brain it's coming back so you know that's scary right and and i don't mean to scare people but like we have to know the truth right? You have to know the reality and the truth and the facts. And if you can face those, if you can face your fear, right? If you're willing to expose yourself to the worst case scenario, to the stuff that's scary and not put your head in the sand and hope for the best, right? And yeah. assume that everything's, that you're going to be in the small group of survivors mm -hmm. somehow by luck, mm -hmm. right? That luck is not a strategy. Um, if you're willing to face your fears, then you can overcome them, right? But you have to face them first. You, yeah. If you hide from them or run from them, right? Or try to just pretend they don't exist, you're, you're setting yourself up for failure. And that's not good. That's not what we want, right? We want people to get well. Right. And, you know, coming full circle to something I said earlier about cancer being a battle, it's like, it's not a battle, right? If, it's, if cancer's a battle, then everybody who dies is a loser. Mm. And I don't believe that. I think that's that's an that sentiment is awful. It's it's horrible, right? People die because they got sick and they couldn't get better. Okay, that's it, right? And so we want to help people get well, survive and thrive and live a long, happy, healthy life. Right? That's the goal. So yeah. there's so much in the nutritional I mean, in the scientific literature about nutrition and exercise and stress reduction, right? And detoxification. These are critical things that a patient has to uh, learn about and incorporate into their life mm. if they want to put themselves in the best possible scenario. In other words, the lowest risk of death. Yeah. Right. And that's that's empowering. That's important, right? So um, 
this is what I spend my time doing, talking about these things, educating yeah. people on these things, and then getting really granular with specifics, which I do in my books, and uh, about how exactly to do this. And the new book, the cookbook, is is all plant-based. There's mm -hmm. a section in there that's the hardcore anti-cancer recipe section for patients. And then there's the, another section in there that's just, hey, you just want healthy living, delicious recipes that are easy to make, mm -hmm. you know, at the plant-based, whole food plant-based. Thank you. Showing mm -hmm. it off. It's gorgeous. That I mean, that's the thing I really wanted to say about it. First of all, I love hardcover cookbooks. I have to say that. Like, you just know it's going to last so much longer. But then these, you know, having photos of what you're having is just so good for a cook because you know what you're kind of going for. And these photos are just gorgeous. I mean, come on, look at these photos. Um, so I want... I want to say, first of all, thank you so much because all this has been so inspiring. I have to have you on again because I have a million other questions. Um, I want to get into the, the cookbook in just a sec, but for those of you who don't know, um, my entire business is based on the mindset around healthy eating and Chris's entire business is based on the mindset around healthy eating. So we have some amazing synergy here in what we do because, um, and that's why I want to have you on again, Chris, is to really talk about your beat cancer mindset and that, you know, you say right in the beginning of some of your videos, you change your thoughts, you change your life. Right. Um, and so I want to know more about this at some point, we'll get into this, but, um, just back to the cookbook stuff then. So, so but what I wanted to say was you have a coaching program that's about mindset, um, you know, for those who are going through cancer or even anyone who's just interested in the mindset part called square one, right? You know, just briefly tell us about that. Yeah. Um, the square one cancer coaching program is something that I created in 2016. And uh, basically I used to do one-on-one -on -one coaching. Uh, after I started the blog in 2010, people just started reaching out. I mean, it was just constant. But can can we talk? Can we get on a call? Can I yeah. ask you some questions? You know, so I started doing coaching, and um, it really just grew and grew. And I was talking to tons of people every week, and and I I learned so much, not only from my own journey of getting well, but then from coaching and counseling other cancer patients. I just learned the the things that they're dealing with. I've I've seen it all. I've heard it all. Like yes. nothing really surprises me anymore. Yeah. And, and, I, and I've also interviewed dozens and dozens of cancer patients who have healed holistically against the odds. Some of them did no conventional treatment. Others healed after conventional treatment failed. Like these are incredible stories. So it's not just about me. In fact, you can toss my story out the window. There's so many other incredible stories that are better than mine, yeah. right? So uh, I realized again, early on that, you know, once, sometimes it just takes one story to change your life, yeah. right? One story, and for me, I read a book by, I was sent a book by a man who had healed colon cancer with raw food. That one story completely, you know, changed the course of my life. Yes. And I'm so thankful for the man who wrote the book and for the man who sent me the book, two different guys. Mm -hmm. And, but I also realized that, you know, one story's great, but the more stories we can get together and share of survival, right, of, of healing, the better. So I, I'm, con I'm continually, I mean, almost every week or two, I'm interviewing someone else who's healed cancer against the odds, you know, long-term yeah. survivors. Yeah. And that is, I just have, I just get so much joy doing it. I love hearing their short stories, sharing their stories, learning from them. So anyway, the point of all that, it's a long way to answer this, but Square One is a coaching program. It's 10 video modules. It's basically 10 hours of coaching. It's what I would teach you if we did 10 one hour phone calls and it's mindset and attitude. It's all about the anti-cancer diet, how to eat it, uh, exercise and rest, detoxification, supplementation, testing and monitoring your, monitoring your progress, right? There's a lot to learn and it's just all laid out in this step-by-step -step course. And that's, people can find it through crispycancer.com. Mm. Uh, if you, and we have this incredible private support group online support group community that's just the best thing out there mm. and uh for members of square one so anyway that's been such a joy to you know i'm just uh, yeah it, it's so much it's taken a life of its own it's just so much bigger than me 
uh, at this point. <laughs> nice. But uh, yeah, that's for somebody that's like really serious. Like you can read my books and and get tons of information and get going. And and if you want to take it another step that's further, so then yeah, yeah, go through the Square One program and join our private community and and get you know connect with people that are like minded that understand you that can support you and encourage you. Some of them are you know years down the road. Some of them are a few months ahead of you. Some of them are just getting started, but yeah. we've got, um, yeah, a great community there. So that's really fun. And uh, yeah, I'd love to come back and talk about mindset because mindset and attitude and stress, uh, faith and forgiveness, like these are really critical things that you cannot ignore, right? You can do the diet right and you can do all the therapies and treatments, but if you don't address the root causes of stress in your life, you may not get well because they they can outweigh everything else you do yes. if you're if you have a lot of anger and bitterness and resentment and envy and jealousy fear worry right all of those emotions are so negative and those thoughts and emotions are so negative and powerfully destructive mm. to health yes and uh and so you know i'd spend a lot of time talking about that stuff too <laughs> and i love to talk about it because for some people, that's the most important thing they need to do. I'd say for most people, it is. Yeah, I agree. Thank you for that. Um, so check out the Square One program on Chris's website, chrisbeatcancer.com. I'm going to link everything down in the description below the YouTube video or above the Facebook video if you're watching it on Facebook. And of course, guys, okay, even if you don't have cancer, come on, like you need this book, especially for my audience who's, you know, nutritarian. We don't do salt, oil, or sugar, but and there's some um, like maple syrup and salt and things like this, but so easily adaptable to the nutritarian diet. It's ridiculous. These are so good. I'm going to be actually, Chris is going to allow me to put up a couple of these recipes on my YouTube channel as well. So watch out for those. Uh, we're going to be doing an African stew, sweet potato tagine. We're also going to be doing a peanut butter cacao cup. So watch out for those, uh, link for this book down in the description. Um, pick it up guys, get it really so good. Chris, well, thank you. Go ahead. I was just gonna say, you know, Dr. Joel Furman's a buddy. Uh, nice. and yep. yeah, and he's just terrific. I love John. I've interviewed him and he's, he's awesome. Yeah. He's great. And, uh, yeah, the recipes are, are definitely, these are very, very low salt, yep, they low are. oil recipes, and, and they can all pretty much be made without salt or oil. Yeah. If you're, you know, if you're, uh, you know, of that. Uh, avoiding those things. Yeah. 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 If you just want to avoid those things. Um, so yeah, easy to incorporate for sure. And, and, uh, they're super delicious. And if you buy it on Amazon and, uh, you make some of the recipes and you don't love them, you can just return the book. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or send it to me. I'll take it. I can there give you it go. to someone else. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I, I can say that with confidence because we know uh, yeah, all the feedback, easy. all the recipes are super yeah. delicious and easy. That's the thing. Mm -hmm. They're easy to make. They may have a long list of ingredients because we, tr we try to pack every recipe with as much anti-cancer nutrition. So we want yeah. them to be nutritionally dense, but they're not complicated to make, right? Yeah, and, and that's super I really, important. I really like about this too. So I just want to point out, you have um, a section here about, I mean, there's diff different ways to eat in your book as well too. So you, as you said, you have the beginning of the book is the sort of more hardcore cancer related. You got cancer right now. You want these recipes. And then you kind of go on and you've got the more just regular whole foods, plant-based kind of, but still nutrient dense. You have a section um, that's the bowls, but then you have just these basics too, which I think is really great for anyone who's getting started with this way of eating, learning some really good basics. Um, I think this kind of section here is so useful for someone who's just a beginner or just looking for better flavor even, right? And you've got your flavors on lock here. And then um, you've you. got, you got a whole basic session, but then you got the whole dessert section too. And uh, we're going to be doing some recipes from that section on the website. I mean, Mexican chocolate hummus, you guys, um, frozen treats. You've got some nice creams mango turmeric tart sorbet are you kidding me like think about those nice anti-cancer benefits just in that dessert purple sweet potato pies these are great recipes for thanksgiving as those well are so good yep. those are so, really good so, <laughs> mm -hmm. so many different ways you can use these recipes convert somebody if you know somebody who has cancer even great idea make them some of this food i i recall that when 
I found Eat to Live. I read the book in a weekend, but it took me three months to try my first recipe because I was scared. I was like, this isn't going to taste good. And I actually had a girlfriend who is the one that introduced me to the book. She made me a smoothie and a salad. And I was like, oh, I can eat this way for the rest of my life. But it was I needed someone else to cook it for me to actually, so, you know, this is a great way to introduce your friends and family to, especially somebody who might be dealing with cancer to show them that it can taste amazing and make you feel so good. So, yeah. Something else we did with the book is we, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of really cool anti-cancer nutrition science. And so we sprinkled these little factoids throughout the book, you know, in, in, in along with the recipes. So you can learn things about, you know, why did we use this ingredient in this recipe? Like what is the anti-cancer benefit? Right. And so, uh, I thought that'd be fun to do. And, and I've just, you know, stacked up so much research over the years. I'm like, I got to inject this into the cookbook, you know, so that people, so they not only, and look, there's a bigger point here and I probably a great place to, to close is that the most important thing is you have to believe that you can get well, Mm. right? That is the number one thing, period. You have to believe that healing is possible, Yeah. right? This is the, the most fundamental sort of foundational principle of the beat cancer mindset. Mm -hmm. You have to believe that healing is possible. If you believe it's possible, then that empowers you. It unlocks this motivation or, uh, you know, uh, this drive in you Mm -hmm. to start learning, right? To like, okay, I believe healing is possible. What do I need to know? I don't know what to do. I need to learn, right? So then you start learning and reading and researching and you take action, right? Faith without action is dead. This is from James, right? Faith without works is dead. That's action. So almost pretty much everything I do is to that end, is to inspire the belief that healing is possible. Because I know if I can spark that belief in in someone, then they can they can use that. They can fan those flames, right? And it starts them on their healing adventure. Yeah, it starts with belief. I couldn't have said it better. Yeah. And so because, and this goes back to something you said, remember you asked me that question, why don't people change or why is it so hard for them, right? Because they don't believe that healing is possible, right? They don't, no one has told them that they have the power to influence their future. No one has told them that the food they put on the end of their fork can promote health or disease. Yeah. Right. No one's told them. And you know, as soon as I started to learn this information, and you, I'm sure your response was the same, it made me excited, mm-hmm. right? I didn't feel judged. Yeah. Like I didn't feel ashamed that I'd been eating cheeseburgers, right? I, I was excited, was like, like, oh, it wow. It was like an opportunity. Oh, now I get to do this. This is great. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I couldn't, A, I was like, this is important. I, I have been harming myself unintentionally. Mm-hmm. I, why didn't anybody tell me? Oh boy, I'm glad I know now. And yeah. let me, what do I need to change? And so that progression of thought, right? And that inspired my belief that healing was possible. And that, and then I realized there's things I can change in my life to help myself heal, yeah. right? And then I started making those changes. And then you get this momentum going where it's like, what else can I change? What else yes. can I change? Yes. What else can I improve, right? Yes. And so there's exactly. this, you can't do it all in one day, right? This is just a step-by-step, stepwise progress in your life that you're just constantly working toward improving uh, you know, the way you take care of yourself and the way you live. And, and so along the way, uh, healing happens. So anyway, I know that's a big rabbit trail, but believing that healing is possible is so important. And that's one of the reasons why I'm including this nutritional science research in the cookbook so that you can see like, no, it's not just, these aren't just apples and carrots. There's so much more yes, to these yes. foods, right? Yeah, and your than- books, your books go together so well too, because re- first reading the crispy cancer gives you the real basic foundation of everything. It gives you the, the knowledge, scientific knowledge and in- industry knowledge and all this kind of give yourself that foundation. Then you've got beat cancer daily, which is going to help you on a daily basis, just sort of keep that going. 
and then you got the food at the same time. So it's this all encompassing. If you want more information about the mindset, of course, Chris has square one and, and so many videos that are free as well on his YouTube channel. Um, check him out Tons. on YouTube, subscribe, um, and, and on his website as well. His website actually has a free video available from his square one program too. It's super generous to be able to give that as well. And you get so much information just in that, that first video. So, um, Chris, Wow. This is fantastic. I can't wait to enter. I want to interview again already right now. <laughs> we have so much more to talk about. Thank you for spending some time with me and my audience and for um, dedicating your life to helping folks who are going through something that could be scary, but um, let's add some hope to it. Let's add some empowerment and some excitement to maybe this is the wake up call, right? Right. Maybe this is the, the moment that you get to actually start believing that there's something else for you. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. You're awesome. I appreciate what you do so much. And I'm excited for your healing journey and survival story. And I'm, I'm glad you made the choices you made and that you're using that to, to help encourage and inspire other people. And we just, it's good to be on the same team. Yeah, it is. And uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to doing it again. Thanks, Chris.